All right. Back for another High Existence Dialogue. This is Mike Slavin alongside my colleagues and co-conspirators at High Existence. We got John Brooks in the building, Eric Brown, affectionately known as EB, and Mike Cole Adam. Actually, this is Mike's <laughs> first Dialogue's uh, appearance. So, Mike, great to have you. Excited to uh, to dive into a sprawling and interesting conversation. At least that's what we're hoping for here. Um, and so, just to kind of get things, get the ball rolling, we were just talking before we got on. You know, really press the record button. Um, you know, we're we're a fully remote team, and that comes with its challenges and its benefits. Um, but we've been doing a lot of uh, feedback with each other and the sort of support that can come from that. And it just it just shows the power of having individuals in your life who you trust to to you know hold to, to hold you lovingly and offer you input around the ways that, that you can improve and and get better. And I'm just curious what you know as we've been engaging in this process of you know exchanging feedback with one another. Has there been some insights that have surfaced, or really, what's the value that you guys see in engaging in this kind of process together? Uh, one of the ways this comes up most strongly for me is that you're always blind to your own blind spots. Like literally by definition, they're not something that you can see. And you, I mean, you could stumble your own way for, man, years or decades, no joke, um, until you actually have some sort of an insight or self-reflective experience where you finally catch it. Or <laughs> you can team up with a group and they might be able to catch it in three weeks if they're willing to be honest with you. Right, and that that kind of feedback loop of hey, I'm tracking something and I care about you, and even if I'm not even correct on it, I want to bring it up and see how you react to it. Uh, damn, closing that feedback loop really quickly can it has not even can it's not even a potential. It has massively accelerated my own process, people on the team, the people that I've come across. But it, it takes a it, it actually requires a level of uh, safety safety and shared context before people will even enter into that. Because, I mean, if you've just met someone or you're in a space you don't feel safe in, I mean, you're not going to share something that is a partially digested thought or just a random behavior, behavioral tweak that you caught. But, yeah, if you actually come into a space in a context where that's allowed for and actually expected like yo you're part of this team i expect you to actually hold me to a standard and take me to task then it becomes a lot easier and yeah once you get in the collective vortex of like we've been using the metaphor internally of like a dojo and sparring partners a lot where it's like the whole point of that is yo, i expect you to bring your absolute best and take me to task it's the only way i'm going to improve and man it's been um I mean, I actually just had a collective round table from the three of you last week that really took me to task. And it was, uh, I mean, it was challenging. It was frustrating to sit with. I was super defensive in the moment, but the past few days, it's really sunk in. It's like, oh, wow, yeah, that was a whole area I was unwilling to look at and all the better for it. Um, yeah, it's it's not an easy context to get to, but damn, the the benefits and potential of it are insane. Yeah, so well, that's great, EB. Love that the the reference to your own roundtable discussion. Um, so one of the things that comes up for me here is you could have the best advice about your character, the best insights about your character you'll ever hear in your entire life. Like imagine like the greatest psychotherapist ever constructed the best insights about your character, ways that you needed to change and improve and grow. If those are delivered by someone who you have a troubled relationship with, you won't change. You won't even hear it. It will just be like, yeah, I don't want to hear that. I'm not going to let that in. Um, and there's, there's some research. I don't know who did it. Maybe someone like John Gottman. There's like a relationships researcher. And he discovered with his team, of course, that really good relationships have roughly five positive interactions for every one negative interaction. If you're in a relationship and there are 10 negative uh, interactions and then like the 11th is really good feedback that's also negative in some way, 
it's not going to be delivered properly. You're not going to hear it properly. But if you're in a team and you have all these positive experiences, you have a lot of love, a lot of care. And then after every five really nice interactions, you have direct cutting useful feedback that comes from a place of, we have a great relationship. I really care about you. That's much more likely to get in and, and, ch and change you. Um, so yeah, I think that one of the kind of the, the problems with people that give feedback and they mean well is that they don't have a really good relationship to begin with a really good foundation to deliver it. Um, so yeah, and that's why I think having friends that you actually respect is one of the coolest things ever. Um, it's so nice. And so, pe so many people miss it. <laughs> that's a little uh, compliment for you guys too. <laughs> yeah. Um, also many people are used to these toxic relationships and then they don't think it's okay to firstly actually give feedback sometimes, you know, loving feedback. And yeah, they also maybe emotionally don't feel like it's even possible, you know? And it's kind of like, like a paradox in a way, you gotta have these relationships to believe that it's possible. Right. But how do you do that? Right. And only when you have that first relationship that shows you the way that gives you that love and compassion and support, only then you truly emotionally believe it, not logically, because people can tell you right, what you should do. But if you haven't experienced it, it might just seem like an impossible thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. That makes me think, Mike, of how there are, you know, some people who can't even conceive of feedback being positive. Just feedback is negative because of the way that they've experienced, you know, feedback before is just, it's, it's always been kind of, it's been hard to receive. And that's because there's like an imbalance. Like there's, there's this real sweet spot that I feel like, um, everyone needs to sort of endeavor to, to land in. And that is this balance of strength and warmth. And I'm thinking about how like the sort of parenting styles, and I might get the technical terms wrong here, but you have, you know, really passive, um, on one side of the spectrum. And then you have authoritarian on the other side, which is extremely controlling. And you have the, the passivity. There might be a lot of warmth, but there isn't any strength. There's no boundary around which to like grow or like there's no, there's no like structure. So it's just a free for all. And on the other side, you have authoritarian. It's just so it's all control. There's no space. You just feel like completely, you know, suffocated inside the rigidity of that system. And it's, it's overbalanced in strength. And if you have that sweet spot where it's like, you kind of like, if you, you're, you have like almost like these individuals in your life who can, temporarily from time to time, like occupy the space of like the, the most loving parent you never had to give you the feedback from the place of warmth and strength, then like that can open up such profound, you know, avenues of growth. And this is sort of what we've been putting the, the beacon out for. I mean, we have, we recently launched this community experience. The doors are closed now. So there's no, there's no, you know, appropriate way to sign up, but We've been putting the beacon out for people to, who, who want that kind of community of practice, you know, those individuals who want also like understand like the value of growth, but also understand the value of creating a warm and welcoming environment. And the synthesis of those two things is like rocket fuel for like passion and excitement and joy and all those kinds of things. So yeah. And it also, it's really interesting as we dive into these conversations, every time I listen to one of you guys, I'm like, I'm like, oh man, there's like three things I want to say to that. And then the next person speaks and I'm like, oh no, there's three things I want to say to that. And just like endless in that way. But, um, but yeah, I'm just, I'm blown, blown away by like the privilege of being like around other people who, who like want the, want these things too and want to feel supported by a group and want to grow together, you know? And, and it's like, Accept, it's like accepting of our flaws. Like we all have flaws in ways that we're trying to work and grow. Um, and it's, and that's like, of course we do, you know, and like, let's work on them, you know? That's actually like the first piece of context to find out if, uh, feedback is appropriate is like, are you in a space or are you with people that are actually committed to their own growth? 
Because the answer is actually not yes all the time. Some people are completely unwilling to hear that. They don't receive it uh, well in any sense. So actually, that's like the first one is like, do you know that the other person actually is even interested in hearing this? And then there's levels of, uh, I mean, capacity in a way to handle it. It's just like, how direct do you want me to be here? Because, man, some of the feedback I've gotten and some... I've been trying to get better at actually more and more like really direct pointing at feedback. Sometimes it can be extremely sharp. It can be extremely intense. And yeah, there, there is actually a, a context of emotional support and safety that's required for that stuff because it can be very fundamental behavioral identity patterns that start getting called out there. Um, one of the things that came up across the three of your shares, and funny enough, it came from many of the high existence team. One of my most consistent pieces of feedback I was ever given was to give feedback to people. <laughs> the, the framing of it was like, if you really want to be compassionate to someone, like truly compassionate, you would actually point out the ways that you think they're destroying themselves or that they're walking down a path that at least in your own perspective, would lead them astray. And if you don't tell them that, that's that's not compassionate at all. You don't actually truly care about them if you'd let them go walk themselves off a cliff. But I definitely had this pattern. I see this pattern in a lot of people of just the only feedback you're willing to give is singing someone's praise. It's just a constant like, oh, you're doing amazing. Oh, you can do this. You're so strong. You're so good. Which I mean is valuable. Don't get me wrong. There are many people in the world who actually have heard little, if any, positive feedback about themselves, which is actually ridiculous to say, but it's been true in my own experience. I've heard it from several people. So there is a gift to positive feedback. And you can try to get really specific on that. Like notice really particular behavior patterns, identity traits that it's like, yo, I love this about you. I hope you know that. Um, but it can also, I think positive feedback can also be a, sometimes a default, sometimes even a cop out for people. And actually you really want to, maybe a way I would say this is some of the people I respect the most now have been people who have been willing to call me out on shit and actually take the, the critical side of feedback where it's like, look, I care about you so much that I want to help you course correct. Because this might not be obvious to you, but it's extremely obvious to me. Um, and yeah, that has been a consistent point of feedback that I've received is like, yo, give me better feedback. Give me any feedback. Tell me something that you don't appreciate about me. Um, and that in turn, I think, has actually helped me cultivate deeper trust and respect from the people that I interact with myself. Just like, look, like... I'll hold you up just as you hold me up. And that was a huge, it took me years. It took me years to like reverse that process of like, yeah, but if I don't say something nice about this person, they're going to run away from me and they're going to get upset. Actually, it took a long time to deprogram that and kind of continually seeing that the more thoughtful and caring my pointings were, the more people actually appreciated them. It was like a, process of unlearning but yeah now i sit very comfortably and like yo are you ready to hear this because I'm, I'm not going to hold back i want the best for you like let's do this together i think if you if two people mutually agree to play the game of being honest with each other and giving feedback uh it's one of the greatest bonding experiences you know when you see you see professional fights and they have this big war they're all bloody and broken after it, but they're hugging it out. They have a lot of respect for each other. And you might think, oh, why do they respect each other? They've just beaten each other up for 25 minutes. It's because they actually played by the same rules. Yes, they were actually trying to punch each other, but they were playing by the same rules for the whole time. They wouldn't hug after it if one person cheated, right? They both played by the same rules. So that's why I like the dojo and sparring framing. It's like, for me to give you feedback, I know that our friendship is not at risk, whereas it could be with a lot of people, you know, to, to have the kind of friendship where like, Hey, I've got to call something out now. And I trust that our friendship will remain intact after it. Like, that's like a really nice experience. Like I can finally be honest with someone that I care about. 
Um, and Mike Slavin, your, your comment about the passivity and the, and the authoritarian perspective, the way that I, I recently learned about it was in a book, uh, calm parents, happy kids. And the words that we use were the same, same ones, but it was demandingness and, um, responsiveness. So, um, if you're overly demanding, but also not very responsive, then you're just like the authoritarian type of person. Um, and if you're very, very, uh, responsive, like, you know, on the scene, but you don't demand anything from your children, then you you know, like, they kind of, they do whatever they like. Um, and that's also a really good framework for friendships and community. Like I demand the most of you, but I'm there for you. If you need me, I, I will respond to all of your needs. You know, and that's like such a nice framework because like the best parents and the healthiest kids are the ones that have the balance between being demanding. Yes, I want you to do your schoolwork, but I'm also there for you if you're upset. I'm there for you to listen to you if there's any kind of problem. I want to kind of like flip it a little bit and ask it like a more of a pointed question because I really want to ground this in real world examples for people because I think we have some good stories. So I'd like to ask in what ways have community uh, or mentorship um, or, or like friendships uh, helped you personally over the last like 10 years? If there's any one example that stands out in your mind. And I guess, uh, Michael, Adam, if you'd like to pick it up, but feel free to share anything else that comes up. Yeah, before I get into answering this, I really like what you said. And I think it all starts with an agreement or a commitment right? We are so used to relationships where we don't have or make those commitments. You know, I'm here for you. You're there for me. We can give each other feedback, negative or positive. We're just there for each other. We, we hold the safe space. We're neutral witnesses in the same time we're supporters. And yeah, so it starts with that. Um, and most people don't have that. And a part of of what we're trying to do actually is creating that even for strangers. Because maybe you don't have in your physical environment people that can do that with you. They don't know what you're talking about. They don't know what commitment, you know, a commitment to have a safe space, you know, uh, this vulnerability. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, Yeah, and then so we want to give people this opportunity to meet those like-minded people who understand how important it is to have that family to have that space, safe space. Um, yeah, people that really helped me. Yeah. I think much of my growth was in relationships where we made this commitment, for example, you know, or from the first place we, we put it out there and it was like, just so you know, I'm going to let you know that like, when I see something that you can improve, you can always also always tell me when you see that I'm actually valuing that. I know that I have blind spots and how much this can help me become a better person. I will never take anything personally or get offended by anything. It's out of my, like I, I never get offended truly. If I do, it's just cause at the moment, um, I wasn't centered, but then I would, I would bring it up and share with you that I was aware of it and, and apologize. So yeah, just always feel free to do that. Um, yeah. So with business partners, um, in therapy, I just started therapy not too long ago. And that's been the most amazing thing that I've ever done. Actually, just intentionally going to the se- session where I'm opening up everything and I get feedback, negative and positive, you know, with agreement beforehand. Like I am here for you to tell me how to improve my life no matter how hard this is, you're going to show me my darkest places. You know, you're going to, we're going to open everything up. I trust you that you're not like overdoing it. And like, like that you also know to do it with the right balance, but this is what I'm here for. And for example, in the past three months, I've had so much growth when it comes to understanding myself. It's the first time that I'm truly facing my traumas. I've been pushing them so far for a long time and 27 years. And and it's been okay, but I got to a point where it became a bit too challenging to go through by myself. And that made me ask for that help. And yeah, it's been like an amazing three months. I've integrated parts of myself that I, I never thought even existed actually. 
Um, and yeah, it's just been a, a blast so far. So I want to, I want to try to answer your question, John, but there's some distinctions I have to hammer out there that came up while you guys were talking. And one of these <laughs> things is, um, so I want, want people to just be mindful. It's like feedback. You really want to be able to trust the individuals that you're, that you're working with, obviously. And, um, there's, cause there's this dimension of feedback that I worry about. And really this is true. This is kind of like a general principle, like anything like can be, um, used sort of in a covert way. Like you can have a hidden agenda to it. And there's sometimes that people will use feedback in a, in a way that is, um, not, not in your best interest. It's actually emotionally charged and it's, and it's, um, it's useful for their own agenda of trying to get like kind of retaliate in some, in some instances. And so just because you receive feedback from someone doesn't mean it's high quality and doesn't mean it's coming from the best place. And so it's like the idea of being 100% receptive to all feedback, um, is, is something to be, you know, there, there are certain instances where a community or an individuals can posture as if they're wanting your growth, but it's really, if you really like connected to it, it's actually not in your best interest. This is like a weaponization that's happening there. And so it's like the, the real delicate discernment around, I actually trust these people to give me earnest feedback and I know that they have my best interest at heart. And that's a really important box to check because if you can't have that, then engaging with the feedback is just like, it, it just gets super, super messy. And I think this is re related in some ways, but also distinct, like the sense of like the support that we provide people, it's really important that it come from a place of non-coercion. Like if I was removed from their life, would the absence of my presence cause them to stop doing whatever it was the thing that they wanted to keep doing because they like, are they doing it just so that I, they don't feel like they let me down. And in that, and if, if that is true, then I feel like it's not truly being chosen. And I think giving feedback in a way that enables people to choose it and really choose it and not feel like, Oh, I have to do this. Otherwise I'm going like, I'm going to. I didn't, I'm not going to do the thing I said I was going to do. Then you're sort of like contorting yourself and allowing yourself to be like kind of, you know, either in consciously or unconsciously coerced by your social relationships. And that will create inner dissonance that will may eventually cause you to rebel against the thing you say you want. Right. So it's important for us to be able to choose these things. Um, yeah. And that, that felt like a really important piece. I think there was another distinction, but I just think there's, I noticed in myself, and, and Mike was really a good person, I think, in, in helping me get through this. And, you know, there's definitely room for improvement, but under stress, I, I, my communication would collapse and then, and, and kind of like go radio silent. So I like, rather than like, basically it's like leaning into communication and it's almost, there's some perfectionist tendencies that I think were in there for me, or just like wanting to have everything ready before I shared it with the world. And that might be related to my magician tendencies of like, I'm going to practice, practice, practice a trick and I can't show it because then if you see the magic, then it's ruined or something like that. I've actually never made that connection before. Maybe there's something like that, <clears throat> but, um, but yeah, it's just like working to, even under stress, like just keep the communication high and that helps just keep, that actually is a good mechanism for dealing with the stress and getting the support. So that's one of the things that, um, that surfaced as you asked that question, John. Um, do you have any examples from your past, like related, cause you, you shared some stuff in the ascent, um, where you found different kinds of mentors, um, and you kind of put yourself out there and you met different people on your journey. Um, and I really like some of the stories you, you told. I would just love to hear about one of those, the, a significant one, if you could. Yeah. It's, so it's hard. It's hard for me to think of a, something that was like direct feedback because a lot of the value from those mentors was more of like a modeling thing of like giving me an example, a context of like, like, so that I understood like, oh, this is a way of being that is available to me. And so let me, let me jump into that. Let me, let me try that on. It was less about like, Hey, Mike, specifically this thing you should tweak. And it was more about like, oh, wow, I'm watching the way he does that. And, you know, cause when I first moved out to Colorado, I was working with this guy, 
Phil, who was writing this blog called The Feel Good Lifestyle, was very compelling to me. I actually found his blog from High Existence, so it's like the connection is, is it goes it goes back, you know, many many years. But um, but just watching the way that he worked and the and the kind of discipline and devotion that he brought to his work was like, oh wow, okay, I can step up in this way. Work doesn't need to be this thing that is, you know, um, that lacks that kind of spirit. Uh, of commitment, you know, um, because I didn't really have that. I had examples of, of people working in office jobs who don't really want to be there. Cause it's, a, you know, it's like, it's not there. They don't have genuine enthusiasm for that stuff. So seeing someone who had genuine enthusiasm and actually was pushing themselves, I was like, Whoa, I can do that too. But it wasn't like a specific, you know, kind of like thing. It was like, here's the key unlock. It was more, it was like, I, I think I've benefited a lot of from modeling from others. The modeling way of being thing is actually too good to overlook. That's, that's, yeah, I have a few, a few examples of that too. Uh, going all the way back to the beginning of John's question is like, one of the most powerful things community has ever done for me is shown me how much I lacked it throughout my entire life. The moment I actually arrived in what at first was a feeling that I later understood was like communal connection put, put a very challenging mirror up to me for a few damn like weeks and months where it was like, I have been missing this my whole life. Like shared proximity with people isn't necessarily a community. You might label it a community or a neighborhood or whatever, but I mean, I think back to, I, you can, you can look at suburb life. You can look at people who live in apartments. Apartments are one of my favorite examples of this, where it's like, there's probably like 300 people in a building and you probably know one, which is the person that you live with. And like that just vast lack of community was existed in my life for a long time before I stumbled into at first the kind of digital sphere of high existence and then into the physical sphere of high existence with the retreats. And it was this glowing light of like, oh, people actually care about me. Like they're actually interested in what I'm about to say to them. The most fundamental inflection I think community ever gave to me was it flipped the feeling of most of my life. It felt like when I was interacting with people, it was like, oh, okay, that's enough. Like you don't have to share anymore. Like stay in your little box. Like, let me put you there. Um, yeah. Like a, it was a feeling of like, don't be too much. Don't get too strange. Don't challenge. Don't push the envelope too much. The thing, the flipping was when people started asking me like, oh yeah, that's cool. Can I hear more about that? Or like, I can see that there's more inside of you. Like what will it take to bring it out? Like people are actually wanting to see an expansion instead of trying to force a contraction of me. That was unbelievable. It was such a, it was like, a, it was literally a breath of fresh air, right? It was a huge inhale. It was like, oh fuck man. Like people actually want to hear this stuff. People don't. People aren't getting bored of it or they don't think it's too crazy. Just that like shared interest, shared respect, uh, shared love was absolutely pivotal in my life because it, it let me sprint on my own development rather than kind of like tinker with it in the corner of like, oh yeah, I'm going to work on myself. I kind of like what I'm doing, but no one else wants to hear it. Like that was such an unbelievable shift in my life that, yeah, it's it's hard to actually understate how much that just gave to my my soul and my psyche. The mentorship thing is related because it can bring out the best in you. Mentors for me, it's a, it essentially relates to my first point, have been able to poke, maybe this is the way to say it, they have been able to decouple in my head or create a distinction between giving critical feedback or direct criticism without the removal of love from the relationship. And that was a huge, again, like paradigm shift for me where it's like, wait, you can still love me 
as I am, even while you can point out all this shit in me? Because most of the time, I think for most, this is essentially the definition of conditional love, where it's like, oh, if I can find things wrong in you, that means I'm going to love you less. And mentors and community were able to actually decouple that or make them unrelated, where it was like, look, your worth, your value, my love for you is not in question here. It's not up for debate, but yeah. I mean, I got things to say. If you want feedback, I can definitely point point them out. And that shift as well was just huge because what it does is it creates a safe space. Um, they actually essentially give you like a hug. They build up walls around you where it's like, look, love is here. You're going to be witnessed. You're going to be seen in your process. And if you want to keep going, you should work on A, B, and C. Work on these three things. And then, And again... That combination of the space to do the work while also pointing out largely correctly the material that could become the work for me, again, catalyzes what could be years or decades of work into perhaps days, weeks, or months. Because, yeah, I was being shown what to do and then given a space to, like, integrate and do that work within. And, man, if you, like, back at home, back in the world before that, it would be, A, I couldn't figure it out because no one was able to tell me. It's hard to see your own blind spots. And then you just have a context or an environment that's not supportive of it. They're actually resistant to it. And man, it just makes it just makes the whole process so much more difficult. So yeah, for me, it's been hard to understate the impact of both community and mentors within the community. I remember uh, apotheosis is a really good place to, to to fuse the kind of theory and the action taking. I remember EB, like you and I, we had some some fun kind of dialogues and decoded some patterns and then immediately set up like action steps on the retreat that we could implement. So it's like it's like real time kind of mentorship in action, which has been which was always really fun as well. You can do it in a light hearted way. You kind of gamify your own progress. Uh, a memory just came up for me on the modeling thing. And I agree that modeling is very, very powerful. You know, maybe it's mirror neurons. I don't know how legit mirror neurons are, but the, the concept to me makes a lot of sense. Um, so years ago, early 20s, I was getting interested in confidence and, you know, walking through the world with ease and and just feeling better and more grounded in myself. And I went on holidays and I met, it was like a family friend. I met a guy who was a, who was like an ex paratrooper. And when I met him, he was like late forties and he was a, a uh, he had a business where he was doing bodyguard work for princes and things like that in, in like Iraq and Afghanistan. So he was like a hired high level bodyguard, you know, like, and so like in the morning he'd go and shoot his gun and stuff like that. And like I spent a week with this guy and just the, the, the kind of at easeness that he felt with himself when he would walk into like a bar or you go have food, the way he would kind of like look around the environment, the way that he would communicate really clearly because he'd have to like organize a team of people that would have to look after like different people in, in conflict zones and stuff. Um, the kind of competitiveness that he showed, like he had all these very interesting character traits that being around, I felt like just being around him increased my confidence level and my groundedness more than reading books could, because <laughs> I got to just feel that energy and was like, damn, this is, this is possible. This is, this way of being is a legit way to be. And I just remember having a, a distinct confidence boost coming home after that experience. You know, and I think we've all had stuff like that, that has happened to us in terms of the, the feedback process. When, when someone buys something from a, like a, a sales page, I think maybe you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but people will often visit the page multiple times before they buy it, you know, maybe like six times, seven times before they actually purchase the thing. Um, and I think feedback is similar, you know, very rarely do we hear one piece of feedback that's completely new to us. And then we just change good friends are often like repeating this feedback over weeks, months, years, and they just don't give up until you get the picture. And maybe they even like slightly increase the intensity until you get it because maybe you just don't listen to it. Um, and so, yeah. And I, and I think like some of my own feedback, 
uh, came from the high existence family, you know, like the, the high existence team and high existence tribe, like related to the trip to the team. And it was actually positive feedback. It wasn't so much here, are all these things that you're doing wrong. Oh, of course I did get that and that was useful, but it was more, more about, wow, you do that thing really good. Like, damn, you have a talent there. Um, wow. I love the way that you did this. And, you know, coming from a, a small town in Wales, yes, I had family members that would say things like that to me, but to actually hear cool people who you really like and who you've met and who you, you admire and you look up to saying that about you, it, it kind of starts to give you this confidence to try a little bit more to express yourself a little bit more. And then because you're expressing yourself, the feedback loop comes in and then they, they, they tell you what they liked about that. And then you start to grow and, you know, you know, people might say like, Oh, you, you can create content easily. Now you can write, you can speak, you can create podcasts and stuff. But this is just a series of baby steps that came from people nudging me and telling me that I was doing well over a period of years. So that gradually gave me the confidence to do it. Um, and that's something I actually try to do with, with my friends. Now I, I realized that just singing everyone's praises mindlessly is not helpful but to genuinely find things that you do like in other people and to let them know is very healing and very good for them. So I really tried to like, if I see something, I'm like, yes, I saw something that I really like about you. And I tried to point that out. Um, and then on the flip side, if you get good at doing that, then when you come in with a less positive feedback, maybe like the remark that is like, I saw you do something that I didn't appreciate it hits much harder, you know, cause they're like, Oh, okay. There's a, there's a reason why you're calling me out on that. It must, have, it must've been significant. Yeah. There is like a trust rater, right? Like if this guy is genuine with me and he tells me or, or like all the, like the, the good things and he's pushing me forward and he cares for me when he says something negative, I should trust him as well. Right. Um, I really, I could really relate to what you said. People, people keep saying it's like a very famous saying you're the average of the five people you're closest to right but it's such an important thing to repeat a few examples of like how this is this can help you grow or uh, like how important this is like you've said john when people around you they care first of all about you and they they they're compassionate first of all they'll tell you when you're doing things well right and they'll give you this positivity that makes you feel like oh i can do it Right. Then when you, and also when they express and let you express, right, then you, you're doing more and you're expressing more. Then when you feel like you can express by expressing, you're also learning more about yourself and the world, because one of the best ways to learn is to repeat stuff, to teach others. Richard Feynman keeps repeating that. Like one of the best ways is to teach others in the simplest way, right? When your environment doesn't care, you feel blocked. You don't want to share with them. And slowly you just start, you know, going within and you're teaching less and you're learning less and you're losing energy. And rather than grow, you kind of might go backwards. Um, yeah, that's just like one example, but it's so crucial to have people around you who, who push you, right? Who, who care about you, who let you express, who let you learn. And, and yeah, if you don't have that, it might really be the thing that stops you from achieving your goals, becoming the person who you, want, who, who you want to be. That's literally, I think in most cases, the most important one thing you can focus on if you feel behind. If you feel like something is not right, just get the right people. And luckily today with the technology we have, yes, it's not perfect to get on the Zoom call with people and hang out with people remotely, but it's still way better than to have to keep spending all this time with people who don't care. Right. So it opens up this beautiful portal to hang out with whoever you want, you know, with people that you can truly resonate with and with people that make you a better person. Yeah. And there's something I'm going to go on a little rant here, but there, cause there's a way that community can be framed like, and it's true. Um, but the community is really valuable and beneficial to the individual to go through this process of receiving feedback and, and both negative and positive and, and, you know, being supported in these ways that allow for the growth of the individual. And yet so many people feel an absence of void of meaning in their lives. 
And that is, and in some ways, it's like the preoccupation with self-actualization comes because there isn't a sufficient uh, grounds for or, you know, garden of community actualization. The desire to be able to support each other and grow together, not just so I can, you know, uh, just, you know, sort of lionize myself in my own eyes and just be the best version of myself. It's like, no, it's not just about me. It's about the people who I'm, who I'm growing with. And that is such a vital ingredient that I feel like so many people miss out on and don't, don't, you know, get to have the meaning that you can get from tending to the interpersonal garden, pulling the weeds with the negative feedback and, and watering the plants with the positive feedback. Like I really like the way that flowers grow in there. It's like, you know, Good job. You know, these and doing that together and in, in collaboration with one another is like that's like the amount of meaning that you can experience from just engaging in that process is is massive. It's it's huge. It just unlocks the doors and all these like gnawing questions of like, what's my passion? What's my purpose? Start to fade a lot more into the background because it's so pre it's like, oh, I just want to help the people that I love and care about. I want to support these people that are and like you find and then you can find interesting fascinations from that place, but it isn't like this internal toiling of like, what, like, what is my life meant to be? Like, what am I supposed to do with my life? It's because people don't have these like deeper bonds in like these, these communities of, of collective cultivation. So you could say, um, and so I want more people to have that. And that's part of the, the impetus of the, the community. It's also part of this. This event that we're going to be uh, hosting in February, well, it's already February now, but it'd be the 18th and the 20th. It's called Metamorphosis, which is a three-day uh, online gathering. We'll have a link in the in the description and all of that. But it's um, it's a free event that'll happen over the course of 72 hours, and we're gathering a bunch of really awesome speakers to to speak to the subject of ritual. And this is another thing that I think is is sorely lacking in life. Like there's this phrase that I really love called time famine. Uh, and it's the sense that we just don't have enough time. We just don't have enough time. And it's just like, it's like, it's just like always to the next and everything is always on and on and on and on and unfolding, you know? And people also have this feeling of like productivity of dys dysmorphia is a thing you could say where there's, they've never done enough. Their output has never, like they've never, like it's always feels like there's more to be done and there is, but there's this, this like restlessness that I feel like we're plagued with, we're conditioned into we're not feeling like we've had enough time, not feeling like we've done enough. And there are ways that rituals can give this dimension to life that enable us to feel that spaciousness, that enable us to feel a deeper connection to the world around us and our place in it, recontextualize our place in it. We are not just these economic agents producing value in the marketplace. Our, our lives have more value. They, they transcend the economy. It's, it's more than that, you know? And so, um, we're very excited to, to, you know, host this event and, and have, have, uh, people come to us. The second one that we hosted, we hosted the first one back in, back in April, um, of 2020. And I'm just curious with you guys, you know, cause there's this other interesting dynamic where ritual has almost become more associated with the words habit and routine. And it's deeper than that to me. And so I'm curious, like, is there, are there things in your, in your life that you would relate to as, you know, from this ritualistic sense, you know, that feels like a space, a venue for you to visit and like reconnect, you know, to the earth or to yourself or to your, your community, you know, to your ancestors, whatever it may be. I'm curious, you know, for you guys in particular, like, what, is there a flavor that you have that is, um, you know, that re really alive, something that's meaningful to you? Oh, absolutely. You just made a, you sparked a connection in me that I want to sp speak to really quickly, actually both between community and ritual, which is when you're immersed in both of them, one is like a collective and one is an individual meaning the meaning of those things is self-evident. It's not, it's not outside of the thing. It's actually, it's a lived experience of it's obvious that this is meaningful and it actually reconciles the entirety of my life surrounding it. Ritual is meaningful in and of itself. It imbues life with a sense of deep meaning and sacredness. And so does being immersed in community. 
the question I think you correctly pointed to actually dissolves at that point. Like, what is the meaning of this? What is the meaning? What am I trying to do? It actually just dissolves because it's just overcome by the, uh, I'm trying to think of a word, like just, yeah, the immediate self-explanatory nature of the experience. It's like, oh, of course, I don't even need to question this. The meaning, the entire action, the entire community, the entire ritual is just meaning in motion. And that has been, yeah, that has been a powerful uh, exploration myself. Um, I mean, I've spoken about this. I've spoken about two of probably my favorite examples of ritual on several of the past dialogues and podcasts. Um, I guess we can toss one of the articles in the show notes, but I mean, as a kind of training ground for myself, as a kind of practice of meaning, ritual, significance, and things beyond the doing mode, the tea practice has been a sacred ritual in my life for, damn, a year and a half, two years now. And yeah, it comes in and out of um, my my committedness wanes sometimes, and even that is part of the teaching of it, because my own lived experience suffers almost every single time I deviate from ritual. Uh, and that is a powerful, absolutely powerful reminder. But yeah, like arguably the thing that that practice does the most in me is demonstrate not not even demonstrate it provides a lived experience of just the deep significance meaning and okayness of the being mode of just like life itself is complete i don't actually or another way to say it is i bring i can i don't always but i have the capacity to bring completeness to every moment and that has been a super powerful uh, teaching and experience for me because almost so much of what we do is I feel kind of empty, so I need to seek something outside of myself to you know fit that little jigsaw puzzle in, and then I'm complete and whole. And actually, no, ritual has taught me that actually completeness is a way of being that you can operate as and satisfaction, happiness, all, all this stuff is actually just something that you can bring to life. Not that life has to deliver on a red freaking carpet to you. And I mean, my God, you can't even, I can't even correctly articulate the life changing potential that has when you realize that <laughs> the completeness, meaning and happiness of your life is solely in your attitude. Like God, that's actually, that's actually hard to, to uh, overstate the significance of. Yeah, so the tea practice has been an integration one. The greatest teacher of ritual and meaning and significance has been ceremony and psychedelics. It was the first thing in my life that actually even exposed me to the actual lived experience of the meaning of words like sacredness and ritual because completely before then they were empty pseudo-religious terms to me that <laughs> meant absolutely nothing. And after that, after seeing a community where there was reverence and respect and literal sacredness in the experience, and again, tuning into what that was doing to my own system and psyche and soul, it was like, okay, all of the messiness that I feel inside is from a lack of this. Um, and actually, yeah, yeah, between the, actually t the T practice came from the open question of how is it even how would it even be possible for me to cultivate or reach the same level of sacredness and significance and meanings that I found in ceremony in the rest of my life it was actually it became an integration practice from ceremonial experiences um, yoga to an extent has done that for me as well like a non-negotiable practice. Um, and there is a, I think the last point here is there's a very, or at least an increasingly obvious difference in the quality of my day-to-day moment-to-moment experience, whether I'm committed to my practices and rituals or not. It is, it is actually like night and day. You start getting mental fog. You start getting overwhelmed. You start asking a whole bunch of questions. You start spending a whole bunch of time in your head. You start feeling disconnected from life and the flow of time. Um, 
And yeah, it's been, it's been very important for me to just realize, damn, almost everything I want is just on the other side of showing up for things that are important to me, which is largely what ritual is. So yeah, great question. Wow. That was uh, an amazing share. Yeah. Lots that I could <laughs> unpack in that. <laughs> really good. One insight that I had when thinking about ritual is for me, I was thinking like, what I'm, you know, what, how would I differentiate habit, routine, ritual? And the two things that came up for me was that the rituals that I value the most when I'm doing them, I'm entering into a state of being that is very different from my ordinary self, like the person that you're talking to right now. Um, one of them is reading stories to Oliver, my, my son, because yes. You know, when I'm reading a story to him, I'm, I'm, fu I, I'm fully in like actor mode. You know, I'm like singing the songs, doing like voices of witches, doing voices of dragons, like really acting the whole thing out. Um, he likes to do this thing where he likes to speak to the characters in the books. So I'll actually have full on conversations with him as characters. And like, if anyone kind of came in, they'd see a very different version of me in that moment. You know, like there's, there's this, and it's one of my favorite parts of the day to just kind of, everything's quiet, the lights are dimmed. And then you open this book, you have this like children's story and he's just like enthralled by it. And, you know, he's like, I don't want to just read one book. I want to read three books. You know, and it's like, he really enjoys it. Even though you, you we live in this world full of TV and technology and, and stuff, he's still really he, he loves reading, reading books. So that's one. And then the other one, which is quite, quite a contrast to that is Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um, you know, if, if you, the, the person that I'm speaking, that you're listening to now on the mat practicing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, which for those listening is a sort of, it's a form of wrestling, um, with joint locks and submission holds added in. So it's like, it's, it's like wrestling with submission holds and joint locks added in. Um, that's the best way to explain it. Um, and you know, like I, I find myself in situations where I'm, you know, on the ground having these battles, you know, that to the outside world uh, are insignificant, but for me and my opponent are everything, you know, and, I, and, and the, these are battles that are bound up in elbow position and knee position and you know, level of exhaustion. And it really feels super significant. And, you know, like me and my jujitsu friends, if you saw us out in the street, we, you know, we, we just, we're kind of like friendly, nerdy, we, we all wear glasses. Um, but then when we go into the dojo, you know, we, we kind of turn into these people that are very physical and rough and, you know, like slamming each other's uh, jaws into the mats. And it's like, it's a very different kind of, uh, type of play. Again, it's, it's going back to the earlier point. It's an agreed upon rule set. And so it actually brings us closer together. Um, of course the aim is never to hurt your opponent, but just, but you have to have a legitimate threat of hurt. Otherwise they won't really tap. Right. So that's like one of the, you can't like, if you're playing chess with someone, you don't like almost checkmate them. You have to like try to checkmate them so that your opponent reacts. And it's the same with, with martial arts. Um, and in terms of what that's given me is, is it's given me a, a type of internal change that I think can only be experienced through experience. You know, the best type of inner transformation comes from reference experiences in the world. You can't think your way to transformation, uh, with, with very key elements. Um, and so to, to, to see myself going through this process of doing things that are uncomfortable, learning skills that I didn't know, using my body in different ways. Um, it's, it's a beautiful ritual. And, um, even the drive there, you know, like sometimes you'd, I do a 6am class getting up at 5am. It's still dark driving, driving, driving through the dark. The sun is starting to rise getting into the gym, the mats are really cold. There's people there warming up and then you just get exhausted, you know, and you just, you're doing this like strange activity. It's a, uh, it's yeah, for me, that's those two things are really powerful rituals for me. Wow. Awesome. Shares. I was imagine I, like I had a vision of you 
in my imagination, telling the story to Oliver, it made me like so happy, you know, just imagining you being a witch and a dragon. Amazing. So beautiful. Um, yeah, it's very fascinating to me. I haven't thought about rituals much, but something that came up is that when we're doing a ritual, it's kind of like we're choosing to make it everything. It can be tea or Brazilian jiu-jitsu or like MMA to almost death. But it's kind of like a choice that we make. We make the choice to make this moment, however long, sacred. I feel like I don't have enough of it, actually. And also with, with what's happening in the world, like Mike said, you know, we're always bombarded with stuff that like our mindfulness or our capacity to choose the sacred is, is attacked all the time and reduced, you know, and it's so important to, to be aware of it and to try to create more rituals, you know, and bring more sacred to, to our days. Um, yeah, wow. It's like tea for 20 minutes. I, one day I can actually do it more like a habit. And the next day it's a ritual. One day I'm on my phone drinking my cup of tea. It's getting cold and, you know, it's like this another moment. I don't even remember it. And the next day it's the most beautiful 15 minutes of my day. You know, each sip, the warm tea that I brewed, you know, it, it's beautiful, right? So I wonder, Mike, how can we, how, how do you think, can we bring more of that into our life? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think... First step is like recognizing that it's missing. I think a lot of people like it's not even clear to them that this is like a dimension of their life that is lacking. And that's partly due to the fact that their attention is so held captive by the news cycles and like endless news feeds. And like there's we're just constantly and chronically bombarded with like new open loops that lead to like, Oh, when, like, when will this thing resolve new story threads? And we're not arriving at these moments of completeness and closure, you know? And one thing I was like, you said, Mike, like make it everything, you know? And, and Eric was bringing it up with the T where it's like, there's this completeness and fullness. And it's like where these moments exist for themselves and not for some other purpose, not in service to the future, not in service to, um, you know, like our own actualization, even it's just like, it's for itself. And, and, and that connects us to like the, the, it connects us to life. We're not like outside of life thinking about life when back over here or, or, you know, back behind us, we're actually putting our feet in the ground, you know, and like being present with what is. And I think that, you know, really one of my my hopes for metamorphosis is that individuals get exposed to a whole buffet of options that they can kind of like get a sense of resonance around the sorts of rituals that they feel really particularly drawn to and, and connected to such that they can begin to cultivate their own, you know, kind of practice that, that helps them access the sacred, helps them access greater feelings of, of, of timelessness and the meaning that comes from the cycles that we all participate in. And so by seeing like, you know, John Verveke will be there. He'll be speaking about um, imaginal serious play and its relationship to wisdom. And in the way that we trivialize play in our society, play, play is like something kids do. And I'm too grown for that. You know, I'm, I'm an adult, you know, it's funny because I feel like there are so few adults, like actual adults in the world too. Um, and we'll have, um, Henry Shuckman. We just released a podcast with Henry Shuckman and, uh, he'll be, he'll be sort of using ritual meditative practice. He's a Zen practitioner and sort of using that as a, a ritual space to kind of step out of, of the chaos of life and have that as a venue to visit, to, to sort of, you know, um, to connect and ground a bit. And we've got all kinds of, there's uh, liminal dreaming, like connecting to the hypnagogic visionary states that we experience in that threshold between dream and sleep. And like the ritual value of that, there's authentic relating practices. Um, there's, there's, we're going to have this guy, Rupert Till, who I'm really excited about. He's a professor at Huddersfield University in the United Kingdom. And he focuses on um, sacred, basically he would go to ancient, you know, sacred sites 
and recreate music using using you know temples and caves there's video of him being interviewed on the BBC at Stonehenge because of the acoustics of what you would experience standing inside of Stonehenge and he's going to be talking about you know um, music as ritual and, and this kind of stuff uh, Kira the Don will be there there's this you just got to check out the page because we're packing it with with awesome stuff and there's going to be like cool giveaways that we're going to do to make it really festive like we have a whole like um, sort of goodie bag of things that we're going to give to people to help them uh, cult like these items and these objects that they can use to cultivate a ritual um, sort of ritual practice, enhance that ritual dimension to their, to their lives. So I think to answer your question, like it's one, Oh, this is missing. What can I fill this void with? Like what works for me? And, and then the next piece is sort of like a shameless um, kind of like nudge is that, those individuals who attend metamorphosis will be next in line to join our community. We'll open the doors for a brief period, kind of usher some, some new participants who really kind of fit this, this bill, this, these individuals who want to cultivate community. They want to do it from a welcoming, loving space, but also, you know, they want to grow too. They want to expand. So those individuals will come in. So having like participating in a community that has an appetite for ritual, that has an appetite for the sacred is also another important thing that helps, helps you ground it. It helps it make it a part of your life. In the past, ritual was a very, com it was a communal thing. It wasn't an individual process. Of course, there could be ways that an individual would participate in a ritual as an individual, but it's the ritual itself is held in the larger communal context. It's a, it was a communal thing. And so the more that we can bring a community dimension to it, I think the stronger, um, the stronger it becomes, the more impactful it becomes. So yeah, that's, that's sort of my, my answer to that question. I'm curious if that stirs up anything in the, uh, in the minds of, of you lovely gentlemen. <laughs> Oh, that was a nice handoff. <laughs> yeah. What, one thing that's, that's come up around the theme for metamorphosis, metamorphosis this year is, I mean, the first one debuted quite close to the beginning of lockdowns with COVID, extremely focused around managing emotions, emotional resiliency, because even at that time and certainly looking back, like, yeah, humanity was about to go through a gauntlet. An absolute gauntlet. And I really like that. I mean, it kind of emerged spontaneously in you, Mike, this, this notion around ritual and the transformational power, power of ritual, because I mean, we've seen this play out over, yeah, give or take two years now, which is just the slow and steady sucking of anything almost meaningful, beautiful or sacred out of the human collective, I feel like the, the collective zeitgeist is extremely, um, what's the word? Impoverished, maybe? Uh, san yeah, sanitary. Like when you wipe off a, when you like sanitize, like it just got completely, any, any of the juicy nectar of life has just been completely sucked out of it. And man, you, like the impact on an individual psyche and certainly the collective psyche of that is scary. Actually, it scares me thinking of how this is going to ripple out. And again, when you, when you start asking the question of like, okay, well, what does the equal and opposing force to that look like? Like, how do you reimbue life with again, beauty, purpose, meaning, playfulness, any of it actually ritual fits so many of those boxes. Um, and yeah, so it seems like again, two years into this process, it seems like ritual, this controlled, composed, uh, deeply meaningful practice for individuals and collectives, like seems right on time. Like it seems right on time. And in a way, in a way, community is almost a ritual. It's an active, it's an active process of choosing to enter into a dynamic choosing to enter into a container and actually bring yourself to it and surrender yourself to it, like really to go into it. And I mean, quite frankly, if anyone is listening to this, if anyone has taken time out of their day to listen to the four of us on this podcast, I mean, you already know you're part of the family, man. Like there are a lot of podcasts. There's a lot of media in the world. If you're sitting here listening to this, like you are a deep soul fam. 
huge, <laughs> huge amount of love to whoever is actually listening to this. And man, if you are, there's probably a reason for it. And I would invite the inquiry into yourself as to whether you're actually, you feel the call or feel the need to show up with people to really come back into community and the transformational power that it has. Cause yeah, we talked about feedback and the accelerated growth process. That's just one part of it. I mean, sacred accountability is another part of it. The ability to have your own interests flourish, even just the opportunity to chill with people in a way that is not like coffee or Netflix is equally as powerful. And like, yeah, everything that has been spoken about thus far is really, I mean, there's a, there's a goddamn lot more coming down the pike, but this stuff is being baked into the community. And once the doors open in metamorphosis, actually the first crew, the first waves of people also get to influence what we do with it, which I think is also really powerful. Not only do you get to come together in a community, you get to decide as a community what you want it to be and do and, and provide for you. And yeah, I think those would be the two nudges for me towards metamorphosis and ritual and communities of practice. Yeah, I love that you give a shout out to the people listening to this. Something that I that I wanted to raise earlier on is that in in the community that we've that we're creating, the big emphasis is on video and and being able to see each other and talk to each other in real time, even though there's going to be other types of media as well. Um, and that's like one of the big, the big impacts. So if you are listening to this, you can literally come and talk with us in the community, right. And actually like engage, like in the same way that we are engaging with each other now. And, um, and that's kind of crazy, right? Like you can just come and do that. That's, that's cool. If you like this conversation and you'd like to be a part of it, you can come and do that. And it's really interesting to see the limiting beliefs around meeting people that maybe you, you like to listen to their podcast or maybe you like to read their articles because you can sometimes put this glass ceiling or glass wall between you and them. And so many people I, I've, I've met through high existence experiences that are that when they first met me, they were like, Oh, I, I feel kind of, you know, weird that I'm talking to someone who I've read, you know, the articles of, um, like it's, it's a bit surreal. And I'm like, Oh yeah. Why? Like, I'm just, just a normal person. <laughs> and now those people are actual friends, like actual friends that I'm chatting to regularly. And that my, like, it's, it's very equal. It's really cool. Um, and it's totally possible. You can come and meet people that just because you listen to their articles, or re listen to their podcast, read their articles, it doesn't mean that you couldn't have a really cool relationship with, with them. Um, because yeah, like the whole reason we're creating this community is because the people that we've met on programs like the ascent on pro programs like apotheosis, um, those people are friend friends of ours now. Like we, we have deep relationships with many people that have attended apotheosis. Um, the guy who comes to mind, Ronan, um, he, he attended the ascent and, you know, he's, he's a long time high existence reader. And when I first started speaking to him, he was just you know, like, just kept saying, this is really surreal. I find it weird that I'm talking to you. <laughs> and now, you know, months later, he's, he's, he's published a post on high existence because he, he has a background with writing. Right. And and that's his unique story. And he's, he's collaborating in other ways too. Um, so it's always really cool to see that. And I've been through that process myself. EB has been through that process himself of just being a reader. Mike also one of the early members of the, of the, of the original Seven, high existence community. 71, number 71. <laughs> yeah. Just think about that. Like 71st on the, the, the old high existence community. And now is like, an amazing linchpin in, in the high existence, uh, brand and community. It's, uh, yeah, it's super cool. Yeah. Wow. Also shout out to Nick. Um, right. Who's gonna, who's gonna make the, like put his magic here. Absolutely. Yeah. Who also joined. Yeah. And Jesse, who's now helping us moderate the community, a bunch of people who used to just kind of 
um, take in information from us, right? Or observe are now just coming in and they're participating and they're a part of the family. And you're also invited um, wherever you are to join us and um, hang out, party, learn fascinating things. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's, um, there's something I want to say about the, it was a really interesting kind of inversion because, you know, we think about the, the spirit moving the body, you know, or if you don't like the word spirit, think of, you know, maybe the, the emotional, uh, the emotional body moving the physical body, you know, like you feel a certain way. So you do certain things. And then there's that kind of logic and there's truth to that, but truly it's like kind of like a, it's a system, it's an interdependent system. You know, it's like, it, there's, there's, you can invert it. And there is this book that I read called the disappearance of ritual, uh, by, um, uh, Byung Chul Han. And, he said this really interesting thing. He was talking about how the body moves the spirit. And when you start to take part, like there's this kind of um, disdain for like rote behavior, like repeated kind of action in a way that it doesn't carry like subjective creativity in it. And it's, and it's like, but the movements that are, you know, even pre-established that you, that in doing them can, enliven and awaken, you know, aspects that, um, that, that are hard to kind of turn on, um, outside of, you know, having ritual in one's life. Um, and I just think about how people call like their morning routines, like morning rituals. And it's like, is it really a ritual? Like, are you really, is it like really a ritual? Like in the spirit of that word, like, are you accessing something like, like transcendent or sacred, or is it just this kind of like patterns? It's just a series of habits. Like, you know, like it's interesting how this word has gotten cobbled together with those other words. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it kind of speaks to the, the loss of it, you know, in, in the world. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited about it. I'm excited about the community. All of that's in motion. I'm excited about metamorphosis, which is, I don't, I can't remember if we mentioned this, but it's free. You can access it. You can be anywhere in the world. You can come join us. Come hang out with us. Um, we've, you'll be able to see all of the speakers and all the events on the page. It's, it's going to be a blast. Um, and we also have an apotheosis coming up. I don't know if that's been publicly announced, but if not, I just did, I just, I just said it. Um, but yeah, this, there's a retreat that we're, you know, have, having scheduled. Hopefully there will, there will be spots left. I mean, there is a lot of applications that we're already, you know, sifting through. Um, but that's just another really interesting thing, you know, that's surfacing. And I like to speak to like the version of myself who I was years ago, who, although I had a lot of loving friendships, I felt like there was something missing and there was a component that I like, I wasn't getting met on my interest and fascination in some of these deeper questions of life and to have gone through like the valley, you know, to, to find people who I really resonate with, who really can meet me in these conversations. And I feel like I can, I can grow with, um, in all these, these different ways. It's like, it's possible for you to have that too. You know, like it is totally feasible. It doesn't need to be in our community. We'd love to have you if, if you feel resonance with us. Absolutely. But, but we're not the only kind of like, you know, oasis out there. And so, um, yeah, I just know that people have that thirst. There's a thirst for, you know, that there's connection. And so we want to provide that as best we can. And we're learning and we're growing. We're not gurus on top of the mountain. We're human beings fumbling and figuring things out as best we can. And, um, I think that's part of, you know, the, in, the endearing quality of high existence is none of, none of us are, are sitting up here. Like we've got, we've got all the answers. We just are dutifully doing our best inside of the questions and, and wanting to invite others to do the same. Pointed to a really big point with your earlier comment there of like, yeah, the fact that stuff like morning rituals is becoming a thing demonstrates the almost desperation of the collective psyche of like, I recognize something is missing here. But yeah, if you leave it at the level of like a kind of linguistic flourish, just so that it looks good on the Instagram post and that you made in Canva, like it doesn't sink in, man. It'll never do it justice. And yeah, the lived experience of it, the deep, the deep sacredness of it is huge. 
He also pointed to essentially the essence of like Tai Chi or Qigong, right? A very routinized physical practice that you again bring. It's essentially just cultivating the ability to bring increasing levels of energy and focus to the same patterns and set of movements and just noticing how that shifts everything. Um, do I have anything else here? One of the things, one of the things that I think actually prevents people from going out and trying to invest energy in making friendships is having an unclear sense of whether or not that person is going to click with them. Right? Oh, I don't know if we have the same music or if we like the same things, if they're going to keep showing up. And so you almost get to a point of like, oh, I'm not even going to put in the effort because what if I go two weeks and it just drops off and you never know? Like, <laughs> there's a, there's almost an open and obvious question of like, well, what if you had a space where you had at least almost a guaranteed level of, uh, shared interest and mutual understanding with each other? That'd be a great way to catalyze a whole lot of A, discussion, B, relationship, and C, exploration together. And men, I mean, at the very, at the end of the day, if you, if you have been or are the kind of person who is willing to entertain and explore the things that come out of high existence, you can be damn well sure that if other people are crazy enough to be doing that as well, that you guys have, will have a lot <laughs> to talk about. An absolute endless amount of stuff to talk about. And yeah, so we're just, uh, I mean, I, I, I won't speak for anyone else, but I mean, I still feel this. I've been going through COVID lockdowns just like everyone else. I lived my whole life without, uh, deeper friendships and community my entire life. Like half the reason this is being built is because I want to meet new friends. I want to have a community of practice where we can go through meditation styles together and talk about internal family systems and shit. Like really just bring it. And so damn, like, yeah, if you feel any call whatsoever to like be with people who just want to be doing the same things as you, like there's at least one one space opening up for that now. Um, and yeah, there's a fun, maybe not a fun, there's a, a, uh, a chance to dip your toe in the water with metamorphosis that I'm super excited for. I think a few of us, I'm definitely planning on having a session. I think some of us are planning on having sessions with a whole slew of guest speakers and dance parties. Like it's just going to be a taste of what's to come that could be, I mean, the rest of your life, like, the community itself is already exciting enough to me, but the visions and the plans of what three, six, six months down the road will look like, a year, a decade down the line will look like is, God, endlessly exciting to me. Yeah. One one point on meeting other people that we, we haven't raised yet. So I think one of the best ways to to grow as a person is to go traveling, right? Like, you know, it's just, you, you get to meet people from different walks of life, um, different backgrounds, um, you know, different native languages, different ways of living. But what's potentially an even better alternative to travel? I mean, both have pros and cons, and that would be staying in the same place and having everyone travel to you. Right. And that's exactly what you get in a community. <laughs> you know, you, you, you're going to, you get to meet people from literally like every country there is. Um, and it's, that's one of the coolest things about the high existence community for me is that I have friends in America and Canada, Portugal, Israel, like different parts of Europe. It's so cool. You know, like it's so cool to have such a, an international mix of friends that can teach me things can talk to me in ways that like in real time that I, that I just couldn't get from like a Google search or something like that. Like it pales in comparison. And the, the idea as well is like, eventually we always want to be taking things into physical space, you know, and that's why we have apotheosis retreats as the kind of the culmination of everything where we get to, to, to exist with each other in physical space. If that, if that calls to us. Um, so yeah, that I, I can't really, I just want to put that out there because if you don't have that, it's truly magical and it is possible. Yeah. And eventually we're also planning to do physical stuff within the community because we're going to have kind of like groups in different locations of like-minded people who can actually hang out and meet in real life and physically. 
Um, yeah, but it's really cool what you said. You are kind of teleporting everywhere. Uh, it's not with the same depth exactly, but it's still like such an amazing possibility to have that we didn't have before ever. Right. And I think also this, this COVID thing and, and this weird, these weird last two years accelerated that and created even better solutions to connect in this way and got more people online. And yeah, in a way we're more connected than ever. It's up to us to maybe also make this a ritual. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking about the, you know, John, your, your, your piece there about, you know, meeting people from all of these, these places. And I think about what it was like for my parents, you know, and grandparents and just like how hard it, it could have been to just meet some like-minded people. You might like luckily meet one person because you ran into them at the corner store or something, you know, or you'd have to go to like conventions that only happen like every year and then maybe call someone, you know, but an actual community of like-minded and, and sort of, you know, like-hearted individuals is would be really, really difficult to, to create because you're so bounded by your geography. You know, and then we have this whole, you know, their early internet kind of had these like niche forums that then got eroded with, you know, the, the larger social media companies. And it feels like, you know, you have your, your like group convention, but they just like let in a bunch of like drunken people who are just like knocking tables over and stuff. And it's just like a calamity and chaos. And this part of like the distaste for, you know, like broader social media. It's like, there's a desire to have like doors that you can shut. And know that like, okay, the people who are here are, you know, our people. And you don't really get that with the, you know, broader uh, social networks. Of course, you can always like engage in like blocking and all this kind of like hygiene. But there's something to be said about like, mo like moving outside of these uh, large corporations that have kind of like taken over massive land masses of, of the internet and, and start like building our own sort of oases that can um, you know, support certain intentions that isn't like rooted on the, on the ground of, of those sort of really large corporations that might not have the best interests of their users at heart might only be seeking to maximize profit and all that kind of stuff. So, but that's a whole other discussion, isn't it? Um, so yeah, guys, I'm feeling like, uh, we've covered some really rich territory, some great ground, um, Metamorphosis is coming up again on the 18th and the 20th. You can check out more at metamorphosis.live. Uh, there's the link will be in the, in the, the notes. And, um, yeah, is there anything else you guys have swirling that you want to share? Something, uh, parting words, anything like that? I feel largely complete. One of the, one of the things that is kind of surfacing is something like you don't have to wait until your life is completely intolerable to make a change that is better for you. That sounds super intense, but I mean, it actually is like you don't have to wait until you're in pain to actually move and take a step in a direction that is deeply in service of you and your own, your own process. I mean, I, I, I can say that because I mean, that's largely how a significant chunk of my life was operated under. It was just, you know, accepting a level of good enoughness in my life that would only ever change when it became unbearable enough. And actually there's a whole other script of like, what the fuck do you want? What do you want your life to be like? And actually, at least for mine, people who care about me and people who I care about, who I get to do cool stuff with, has always been an answer there. Um, I think I'll almost leave it at that. Great. Well, this was a joy as always. Um, it was great to have this conversation. It's always stimulating. Hopefully listeners, you got at least one thing you could take away from this and, uh, you know, offer a meaningful shift in your lens. Um, yeah, with that said, we will see you next time. Lots of great stuff coming down the high existence pipeline. And, um, yeah, we're just very grateful to, 
to be a voice in your ear. Thank you very much.